So wait time can really help you in large group discourse when you're trying to get students to understand something that's conceptually difficult. Think about one of the new NGSS standards for Earth systems. Use a model to describe how variations in the flow of energy into and out of the Earth system results in changes of climate. So you want your kids to understand that energy is flowing into and out of the Earth systems and that energy flow affects climate. I picked an NGS standard that's kind of short because I knew I was going to read it audibly and I didn't pick one that was too terribly difficult but one that has some conceptual thinking in it. Now picture that you have given your students instruction on that, they've done some inquiry, they've looked at data, and now you want to have that large group conversation to see how well they're doing conceptually on understanding how variations in the flow of energy into and out of the Earth system result in changes in climate. Here's how wait time comes into, into, into helping. And you got to remember wait time one and wait time two. Wait time goes back to some research Mary Bud Rowe did, gosh, decades ago. And it's been powerful in my own teaching because I found as I learned to wait and be quiet and listen to my students, they would be thinking. And as I heard them thinking, boy, it helped me in my own thinking and my own understanding of what they were thinking and how I could plan differently on the fly with my instruction. I really learned to listen and part of that is a big part of that is wait time. So first wait time one. So picture yourself in front of those group of students and you're about to, excuse me, about to question them some on how they understand this system. You're going to ask a question about maybe do they, how do they understand just simply the flow of energy into and out of the Earth systems? So you want to start there. Think for a minute how you would ask that question. Here's how I would use in wait time one. I would say something like to the whole class, so tell me how Earth's, how energy flows into and out of the Earth system. Jason. And I would call on a student randomly. But did you notice the main thing that I did before Jason? And that was that long three to five second wait. Now you think about, flip it around in your head and think about you're a student and you've just heard, tell me about how energy flows into and out of the earth system. And there's long, this long pause and the teacher hasn't called on any names. What are you doing as a student? Well, most students are scrambling mentally thinking, how would I answer? Because remember, if the first thing you say is, so Jason, tell me how um, energy flows in and out of the Earth system. As soon as you said, called a student's name, Jason, everybody else knows they're off the hook. That's wait time one. Wait time one is where the teacher waits between asking the question and calling on students to give them time to mentally rehearse their answer. And you probably know about equity cards or other random questioning protocols. I like to add that in, but that's another video. So that's wait time one. Try it out because I think you will find that the quality of your students' responses goes up as you learn to use that wait time. Oh, and one thing about wait time, when I first had to implement it, I would take a hand, I would put it behind my back, and I would make myself go one, two, three, four, five, behind my back where the students couldn't see it because I was forcing myself to wait <laughs> three to five seconds. Because most of the research on wait time says that teachers in wait time one usually wait about a half a second if I remember the research right. 
That's wait time one. Well, what's wait time two? Oh, oh, sorry. One more thing about wait time one. This uh, and wait time two both. They only work with higher level questions. If you're going to ask a low level question, then it doesn't make much sense to use wait time. Uh, but with the next generation science standards, there's not a lot of low level questions now, are they? So, wait time two. So, you ask Jason, and he starts answering how energy flows in and out of the Earth's system. And with a wait time two, what you do is keep that poker face and don't say, uh huh, and don't say, good answer. You just wait and let Jason finish. Because what the research has found is that when students have no cue about what their teacher is thinking, what, how their teacher is evaluating their response, they keep going. So again, flip it around. You're the student and you start telling the teacher what you think about energy, how energy flows in and out of the Earth system. What are the cues you're waiting for? Well, students are always waiting for their teacher to give them a signal to stop, like good answer or, oh, okay. And they stop as soon as they get that cue. If you employ wait time two, which is the time you wait after a student gives a response to a high level question, higher, uh, 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 level at the higher level of Bloom's taxonomy, they keep going and they keep talking and their answer keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper, almost always, and especially it's the high achieving students. That's wait time two. And if you hadn't tried it, give it a shot. Because what I've found in a discourse-based classroom, often if I will wait to wait time two, then they will eventually stop talking. And I might at that point say, okay, but I'm also thinking during wait time too and judging their answer against what I'm targeting with my own, with my goal of, like on this standard, do they understand how energy flows in and out of the earth system? And by ha me having the time to think, and it seems kind of odd as of us as teachers, because we're used to that fast pace. Students don't really notice it though. Then when we pause after their response, for us to actually think, hmm, what did they say? Was it correct? Were there any problems with it? And what do I want to do next? Students don't really notice that pause. We do. We think, oh, I'm not pacing fast enough. Wait time two, wait time one and two. They slow the classroom down. I think that they really honor who students are and their thinking. And it gives us time to process what they're saying and plan the rest of the discussion. So wait time one, wait time two. Wait time one, wait after asking the question <clears throat> and before calling on a kid to give them time to rehearse, mentally think, prepare, and to keep everybody on their toes. And then wait time two. Wait after their response to give them more time to deepen and go deeper and think more and give you the full territory of their thinking. And then like I mentioned, the hidden benefit in wait time one and wait time two is the time for us to think as well. Hope that helps.